Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. I'm Jagjit Plahe, and I will be moderating the webinar today and will also present our research findings. I am Associate Professor of International Political Economy in the Monash Business School. My research interests include global governance, trade justice, and the management and organization of equitable and sustainable food systems in Asia. So I'll begin with acknowledgement of country. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which our four Australian campuses stand and pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would like to acknowledge that we operate on lands where sovereignty has not been ceded. Thank you very much. So I warmly welcome all our audience members from all over the world to our very exciting webinar today. This webinar entitled Evaluating the Resilience of Women During the COVID-19 Pandemic in India, an Empirical Analysis, is jointly organized by the Center for Global Business South Asia Research Network at Manash, the Critical Reorientations of Organization and Society Cross at Manash, and World Vision India. It is also organized by Indian Institute of Management Udaipur and by Flinders University in South Australia. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sony Thomas. Before I share my screen, I just wanted to say we were going to be joined by the National Director of World Vision India, uh, Mr. Madhav Balamkonda, but unfortunately he's not able to attend um, due to um, health reasons. So uh, Mr. Thomas leads the Resource Mobilization and Engagement Division at World Vision India. Prior to World Vision, Sony Thomas has spent 23 years in the corporate world as a management executive with successful stints across various domains of sales and distribution, channel management, business development, and customer relationship management, um, amongst many other things he has done. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from Madras University and an MBA from Symbiosis College in Pune in India. So I'm now going to share our screen. Okay. Right. Um, Thank you, Sony. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Jagdeep. I bring uh, warm greetings from World Vision India. Uh, it is very unfortunate that our new national director and CEO, Mr. Madhav, could not be here as is unwell. He is resting and recouping. I'm here to share a brief introduction of World Vision India, the impact of COVID on women, and a little bit of our research initiatives that we have done. World Vision is present in about 100 countries across the globe. And in India, we have been present since 1951. And currently, we are in about 24 states of our country and in a couple of Indian territories as well. We have about 200 plus projects, which includes the 116 of our area development programs, as well as our CSR and grant projects. We work in about over 6,200 communities, and today our work impacts the life of 2.6 million children in our nation. We have divided our nation into six zones. We have offices almost in all the 24 states that we work, and our staff are living in the communities where we serve. Can you have any slide, please? Next slide, please. World Vision India. Next, we work, sorry. Next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, World Vision India works in various sectors uh, where we have different interventions focusing on bringing quality education, building resilient and uh, livelihood programs among our communities and focusing on sustainability, water and sanitation hygiene interventions, child protection programs, disability, gender and women empowerment, 
health and nutrition, emergency relief, especially during the disaster time. Next slide, please. During the pandemic, uh, we saw that women and children were mostly impacted during the decline in global income, and uh, which also led to lack of basic like food nutrition for mothers and children. Uh, this also led to increase in growth policy possibilities for the mothers. Another important fact that we saw was due to the uh, pandemic, there was a huge migration of the laborers who were heading back to the villages from the urban cities due to the definite lockdown. So this uh, also led to more domestic violence at home, and uh, children were also forced to choose child labor, and was also prey to early uh, marriage. Uh, Sony, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I think you might need to have the microphone a bit closer to you. We're losing audio. Okay. Uh, you want me to repeat the slide? Next slide. No. Yeah. You want me to repeat the slide once again? I, I think you could. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw that women and children were hugely impacted by uh, the decline in local income, uh, which also led to the basic necessities uh, like food and nutrition for mother and children being left. And this also led to a lot of domestic responsibilities for the parents, the mothers. Another important fact what we saw was during the pandemic, there was a lot of migrant laborers who were heading back to the villages from the urban cities due to indefinite lockdown. And this also led to more domestic violence at homes, and children were also forced to child labor and was also prey to early marriages. Next slide, please. How did Bolivish India tackle this? You know, from our ongoing strategy cycle that we have for five years ago. We did make some additional uh, focus and, and, and drafted a uh, COVID adjusted strategy, which we called as uh, the CAST during the pandemic, and focus more on livelihood and building sustainability. And in our endeavor, focus on livelihood uh, in 56 locations in 17 states of India, we supported about 17,545 households, where 90% of the uh, beneficiaries were women. Another thing that we did was to train a lot of trainers. Uh, about 778 of them that were facing to the gender equality and social inclusion framework and developed uh, them to be leaders we can go and train with them. Next slide, please. I would also like to talk a little bit about uh, the research initiatives that we have done. Uh, the next slide, please. And, uh, you know, we have had uh, 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 qualitative and quantitative learnings that has been done, which helped us in programming inputs for our advocacy and positioning efforts. We also had community-based and child-centric research reports that has been brought out. We also brought out our India Child Wellbeing Report, uh, which was released for some time back. Also, for 21 keystone, this is a World Vision India research journal and other specific research reports that they provide. And I do recognize my time is up. And apologies if there has been audio disturbance as I am taking this. Uh, network uh, issue. Uh, with this, I hand it over uh, back to uh, Professor. Thank you so much. We yeah, finally back got to you, Professor Jiggy. Thank you. We got really good audio in the end. But anyway, um, thank you so much. And now I'll introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today, Mr. Charian Thomas, who is the regional leader, South Asia and Pacific World Vision International. Now, um, it's part of the World Vision Asia Pacific region. Uh, Charian Thomas is responsible for strategic oversight and coordinating technical, managerial and operational support to national offices in and count this, Philippines, India, Indonesia, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. So he has a 
he, he's got a huge portfolio in the region. Charion brings to World Vision an extensive experience in banking and development finance, infrastructure development, policy advocacy, capacity building, and program support. He also provides practical knowledge gained from advising government clients and community engagement programs. He has worked for over 29 years in corporate finance, project finance, and banking for leading corporations, including IFP, IDFC, Tata Industries Limited, and Citibank. Now, prior to his role as regional leader for World Vision South Asia and Pacific, Cherian was actually the CEO and national director of World Vision India, and he led a team of 1,500 staff serving 2.6 million children through 200 programs and projects across India. Cherian holds a bachelor's degree with honors in mechanical engineering and a master's in management studies in finance from the University of Mumbai, India. A very warm welcome to you, Cherian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words of introduction and I hope that uh, I'm audible. Uh, so at the outset, let me thank my colleagues at World Vision India and the research consortium led by Monash, uh, together with their partners, I am Udaipur and Flinders, for asking me to speak at this event today. Uh, now, August is a very special month for me, uh, apart from the fact that this is the month that I usually celebrate my existence on the planet. This is also the month that I had joined World Vision India seven years ago, after 29 years in the corporate world. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it's it's only fitting that, you know, in you know, seven is also considered a good round number of fulfillment. Uh, and uh, it's to, to be able to look back and see what World Vision India has been able to achieve, uh, even, even through the work that it, that it has done. Uh, I'll start with talking about the need for research and particularly coming from the corporate world where we use a lot of quantitative data in our research. Uh, the fact is I've seen over these last seven years of the fact that both profit and not-for-profit worlds are now increasingly converging. Uh, for one, there always has been a certain modicum of contributions from corporates through their CSR contributions for projects and programs, and that was certainly available. We have in the last few decades seen a greater intensification of fund flows uh, to the development sector from the corporate world. While initially this was done more to uh, serve people at the bottom of the pyramid also as a business opportunity. I think the better understanding of sustainability drivers for business and through the whole uh, the, the whole slogan of uh, people, profits, and planet, realizing that social benefits to communities where the enterprises are located, using business itself to serve needs of larger communities, focusing on environmental impact that they create, the environmental footprint that is generated, uh, and have, have led to a lot more of responsible business uh, and business funding. For, for programs of this kind. Uh, there are increasingly newer kinds of business models through social enterprises. Uh, and that certainly means that the need for analysis and research has gone up because donors uh, who in the past were often people of, you know, of, of a background in philanthropy uh, who had heard stories of transformation, probably saw a lot more of qualitative analysis and had their hearts warmed and then contributed. Increasingly new types of donors are those who want to measure return on investment. They need to recognize what is the kind of impact on funding. And with the kind of availability that we have for data analysis and the digital tools available, uh, there is increasing quantitative analysis in this sector. Uh, so it is not just about bombing hearts, it's equally about informing the heads that has led to this increased focus on research. And for me, uh, having come into the corporate world from a background where research was very important, it was also a natural progression of bringing that bit of that world to the development sector through World Vision. Um, it, it's equally important to note that in, in a country like India today, CSR contributions are not anymore voluntary. They are mandatory. They are mandated by corporate law, where 2% of pre-tax profits uh, are mandatorily uh, and this is a few billion dollars uh, to be invested in CSR programs and projects every year. So that's that's something that is really very important to, to note when we look at the whole area of research. Uh, you now, World Vision India has this larger vision, which is uh, our vision for every child is life in all its fullness. And this is captured through the phrase child well-being. And over the years, we have moved from 
understanding child well-being as a nebulous feel-good concept to something that is increasingly definable and measurable. So at, at one level, if one were to unpack this, it is really about access to good health, being educated for life, for children being protected from harm and exploitation, uh, for safety and security in the communities where they live in. And that can be, the, the term resilience often uh, describes it. Uh, and that is what will contribute to well-being for the child. And there are several indicators that we have chosen to do it. Sony talked about the India Child Wellbeing Report that World Vision India now regularly publishes. I think we've had three reports of this kind already. Uh, and it is based on, therefore, also being able to articulate child well-being in the form of measurable indices and which are which lend themselves to comparison across states and across districts in India. We have done the same with the terms vulnerability and fragility by using uh, indices to measure it. And this has been mapped out at the block level in India as well as at a district level, uh, both to inform our strategy and to make decisions at, in, a, in a timely manner. Uh, again, the very fact that we have 2.6 million children would mean that we are serving a fairly large community uh, and that the primary data of almost, um, you know, a few seven or eight million people is easily available to us. And it's important to use this data uh, to, because it's large data for careful analysis. Uh, and like I said, since impact is becoming very important, it's also for us globally, uh, one of the most critical global initiatives of being impact driven and market informed, but while trying to simplify as much as possible uh, without sacrificing the rigor of analysis, uh, the measure of our impact and tell our stories of impact better. I think that's, that's become really very important for us. And this came out for us very clearly during COVID. In the Asia Pacific region, we did rapid assessment surveys. This was initially done for nine countries. And we had over 26,000 survey respondents. And that's actually a very large number. Uh, a comparable peer which did a global assessment had only about 30,000. So the footprint and the reach that we have gives us the ability to access a large number of data points. And we actually later scaled it to 14 countries. Uh, and we did it again. And it came out clearly with what the needs were of people during the pandemic, which was food security, livelihoods, education, mental health of children. And that was helpful in informing what is our COVID response plan and the country strategy. So to, Sony talked about how India used this kind of data to inform its long, without sacrificing the long-term strategic vision and the long-term strategy that they had to make sure that they responded to COVID appropriately. And therefore, this report on evaluating the resilience of women is actually one more analysis that hopefully will guide decisions as we go forward. Uh, if you look at the graduation model, which is, the, which is what is really being analyzed and its efficacy in making sure that women stayed vulnerable, stayed resilient during this period and did not lose you know, vulnerability or they did not move back into poverty. And the numbers globally are that at least you know, well over 100 million people will move back into poverty uh, because of COVID. Uh, the fact is that we have this definition of who an ultra poor person is, people, someone who faces food in, uh, insecurity, excluded from social protection, government services and markets, very limited asset to, uh, access to productive assets, chronic health problems, and face discrimination of different kinds, whether it is gender-based, ethnic, caste, religious, and also have a lack of community acceptance. Uh, and therefore, the graduation model is designed to deal with these, these shortfalls through four pillars of social protection, livelihoods promotion, financial inclusion, and social empowerment. And there are detailed criteria under each for which the graduation model, uh, and this is a graduation program that was developed all, earlier by BRAC in Bangladesh. And later in India, it was you know, very much popularized by Bandhan, which now is a bank. Uh, and it comprises of very carefully sequenced interventions to address some of these gaps. And these are delivered at a household level in the in a, in a, over a period of 18 to 24 months, depending on the particular context. And a household actually graduates uh, from the program on reaching this criterion. And to put it in a simple way, what it really means is that people move from abject poverty to a point over a 24-month period where they can at least have a basis for sustainable living without sliding back into poverty. And that's really what this graduation means. Uh, and I was part of the first graduation model uh, in, in India, which, which when we when we celebrated it in the year, I think 2016 or so, where we saw the first group in Assam. And 
we were quite happy to see at that point the 99% of the people had graduated and not and we did not have to wait 24 months we were able to do it in a period of 14 to 16 months in in, in many cases uh, and that i think was encouraging and helped us to then scale up this model uh, and it's very important that we are looking therefore at the graduation model through in this report through the lens of gender uh, when it look, when you look at gender in asia and particularly in the south asian region i don't need to emphasize the fact I can see that many of you are from that region. Uh, gen gender in Asia, yes, the background is we have a patriarchal society. We have seen economic empowerment doesn't often necessarily translate into social empowerment. We see this not just in vulnerable communities, even, even during COVID, many of our working women in, in, the, in, the, in the middle class and upper middle class have talked about how there has been an unrealistic burden when they stay at home of having to take care of the household as well as their work without any without any respite. Uh, uh, we have other problems of early marriage, sexual abuse, female feticide, trafficking, uh, selective sex, uh, abortion. I mean, and, and, and there's a whole range of violence in one sense against women. We have made substantive progress. Yes, certainly we have. We have seen how, for instance, the prime ministers of three countries in the past several decades have been women, whether it is Sri Lanka, India, currently in Bangladesh, the current Indian president uh, is a tribal woman, a woman from a tribal background. Uh, we have seen increased political representation, better sex ratios, MMR indicators, but clearly much more needs to be done. And one of the, some of the studies during COVID have shown that the impact of livelihoods has been far more on women than on men. And therefore this report is helpful. And how will this report help? It report, the report helps because it tells us clearly that uh, beneficiaries of the ultra poor graduation model actually showed significantly higher levels of resilience as compared to the con control group people who did not have this intervention and there are there is this is not just india's experience there are corroborating reports from philippines which also show this it establishes the ultra poor graduation as a model that contributes to the well-being of communities not just economic, but taking into account multidimensional aspects of poverty. And for us, from the point of view of children, looking at health, education, and a certain modicum of social empowerment and social protection uh, actually helps this whole process. And so we, we, we think it is useful because we can gain from it in looking at it as a very sustainable model for poverty alleviation and development. Uh, it also, in one sense, has an inbuilt factor of resilience because that is what graduation has assured that it will be subject to a certain level of income shock and that came up during COVID. Uh, and so from the point of view of sustainability, there are some very important lessons for us. And I think the challenges for us and the way forward really would be to see how we can scale it up how we can have more partners use this model, how we can find innovative funding to, 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 to support this. And also at one level, mainstream it with government and with engagement with government to see the graduation model as a way by which economic and social empowerment uh, is, is in one sense translated to communities and also uh, to the most vulnerable members of each of these communities. So I want to really thank all those who have worked on it, who have now put it in the public domain. And I really hope that we'll be able to disseminate it widely and actually see improved levels of usage of the UPG model, not just in India, but in the South Asia Pacific region going forward. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Arian. Uh, thank you so much for explaining what uh, this study is all about. I think um, it sits in that whole um, critical organization, critical um, management actually of organizations squarely because we're saying that a sectoral approach is not good enough. We need a multi-sectoral approach. And this is what the evidence is now showing. You cannot have specialists just in water or in healthcare or in education. They need to work together. And this is what this uh, model is showing. So um, the focus on impact is really important. Um, the research is going to feed into world vision programs, both in India and worldwide. And this for us as a, a research team is very, very exciting. All right, so um, without further ado, I'm going to explain a little bit about the study, but since Cherian has done a lot of that, I'll just start off with um, what we have been up to as a team. So this idea began with conversations with World Vision in 2020, but I have, I, I previously worked for World Vision. Um, and, um, and so I would say the conversations began right back in 2001 <laughs> when I first visited uh, World Vision. And in 2020, we started talking about research and uh, um, research that would have an impact on the ground. 
this uh, research has also uh, started with conversations that we had in the PhD T, a PhD tea room in the Department of Management, where doctoral students Kirti Mishra and Sharif Russell and I used, would talk. We would talk about um, the world and uh, have long conversations over cups of tea. And they are both Monash alumni. And I'm delighted that they're working with me uh, after, after four or five years um, of leaving Monash. So it's fantastic. Now, Keithi approached me in 2021 saying there was a, a, an opportunity for a grant for the Australian alumni. Keithi is Australian alumni who's based in India, so we had to apply via India. We got the grant. We were the only social sciences project to be funded out of the 17 projects. We were the only ones not in hard sciences. And uh, we got uh, the funding. The project is about the ultra poor those on the margins of society, those who have been shunned by society. And ultra poor means that they are under what the World Bank has termed to be um, the minimum that you need to, uh, you need really for survival. Uh, so that's $1.90 a day. Now, we got together from March 2001 to June 2021. We had meetings weekly, sometimes two meetings a week. And uh, we had, um, numerous area experts who are involved from World Vision India, numerous. So we worked together and we followed a very reflexive methodology, which Sharif Rasal will explain. Moving on. Um, the background to the study is that uh, India remains home to the largest number of the world's poor. This is despite India being um, on the cusp of sort of a, a, a global power. It's, it's, it's a middle level power and it's part of the BRICS, but India still has the largest number of the world's poor. And even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit the country, it was ranked 94 out of 117 countries on the global hunger index. And this was worse than Bangladesh and Nepal. Likely those who live in extreme poverty are always uh, at more risk since they are excluded from development programs. So they're actually outside the um, formal organizational system of, um, of development. And as I said, the World Bank describes extreme poverty as living, living on less than $1.90 US a day. And in 2017, the reduction of extreme poverty has slowed down when compared to the past decades. As Cherian pointed out in a report entitled Reversals of Fortune, the World Bank notes that for the first time in a generation, the gains made in reducing extreme poverty have been reversed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the World Bank estimates that in 2020 uh, alone, between 88 to 115 million additional people were pushed into extreme poverty. So according to the United Nations, 47 million of these people are estimated to be uh, women and girls. However, even more at risk are the ultra poor women who live on less than $1.90 a day. And this is due to the social, economic, and financial exclusion and heavy work burdens, including agricultural work and household caring responsibilities, something that Cherian has already touched upon. So in India, of the 350 million people, get the numbers, 350 million people who are extremely poor, one fifth are ultra poor, okay? The effect of the pandemic on the livelihoods of women who are ultra poor are expected to be worse than that compared to men. The main aim of our study is to empirically measure the resilience of women involved in a particular World Vision India program known as the graduation model during the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Charyan explained to you, this is called the graduation model. So we're graduating out of poverty. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first study that measures the resilience of women who are beneficiaries of the World Vision graduation model across India during the COVID pandemic. The findings of this study are very critical in terms of A, informing the policy and practice of World Vision India and other organizations across the world which are implementing this model and using a statistically robust method to develop a reliable and valid scale which empirically captures resilience and will be shared freely across the world uh, for everyone to use and to build upon. It can be replicated and we will put this in the public domain. 
Now, uh, Cherin has already covered this, and I will go through it in, um, in detail later on, just to say that there are four pillars, social protection, livelihoods promotion, financial inclusion, and social empowerment. These four pillars um, mean that the way World Vision and others work on the graduation model is that these four pillars come together. They're not looking at just one thing, just working on finance. So microcredit, for instance, will just be here. Um, or you could have livelihood promotion just here, but this is all of them working together, which makes it more expensive. So here is another example, and all of this is in our report um, of, of the, how the four pillars work. They work together, and that is why we see uh, an increase in resilience. And we now move uh, to our third presenter of the day, uh, to Dr. Keithi Mishra. Keithi is an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Udaipur, in organizational behavior and human resource management. She graduated with a PhD from Monash University. She's an early career researcher who has previously held appointments at the Indian Institute of Management in Lucknow at Monash University, at Swinburne University, and at the University of Queensland. Her area of research predominantly focuses on corporate sustainability, employee volunteering, organizational responses to climate change, and strategizing for grand challenges. Keithi is going to focus on how we as a team looked at the concept of resilience. Welcome, Keithi. Thank you so much, Chakchi. Uh, Sherian actually said this, right? Resilience has become very important. Uh, it has surged to the forefront of conversations when we look at uh, development, when we look at humanitarian aid, both in theory as well as in practice. And the pandemic furthered interest in building resilience as a capacity that enables individuals as well as communities in order to respond to crisis, the crisis like the pandemic that we uh, saw or we are continuing to see. So World Vision India actually applies a resilience lens to its graduation model, which is, as Chagjeet pointed out, designed in a very multi-sectoral and integrated manner so that we can address the causes of vulnerability. And what it does is it combines concepts of socio-ecological resilience, livelihood resilience, and focuses on women participants to actually improve the gender resilience of the beneficiaries and therefore contribute to building community resilience. So the GM's approach of resilience actually departs from the often used concept of resilience that we see in, uh, in engineering, which actually privileges stability and persistence. Uh, by taking a socio-ecological and a systemic stance, uh, and we draw from you know, literature from Holling and Folk, uh, the idea is actually on building three connected capacities. Adaptive capacity, transformative capacity, and absorptive capacity. And what we and why is it that you know we look at this particular conceptualization? Is because at World Vision, through the GM model, we believe that resilience is not just limited to being persistent or being stable. You know, so not just being able to absorb and adapt, but it is also about taking. Uh, use taking, you know, to a certain extent, exploiting the opportunities that these disturbances might present to ourselves. So it's about, you know, recombining some structures, renewing the system itself, and also emergence of new and improved ways of livelihood and livelihood outcomes. So the idea is that we can build build absorptive com uh, capacity, right? So that there is stability, there is buffering, for example. Uh, our beneficiaries uh, have savings uh, so that they can absorb any kind of financial shock. Adaptive capacity, so that in terms of in, whenever there is a crisis, we are able to make certain changes, small level changes to what we are doing. Um, like for our beneficiaries have the option of diversifying their sources of income. And finally, transformative capacity. And this is the key part here, that the transformation is necessary. And this is where the social empowerment Movement of, of our beneficiaries kicks in so that they're able to transform themselves. They're able to think of new ways of network building. They're able to think of new ways of starting businesses. So that is where this the, the approach of GM model is unique because we're focusing on the transformation when we talk about resilience. And also we are bringing livelihood resilience. 
right? So livelihood resilience, we understand it as the capacity of people across generations to sustain and improve their livelihood opportunities and well-beings in turn, whenever they're facing environmental, economic, social, or political disturbances. Now, why is livelihood important for us? Because by integrating livelihood resilience into our understanding of gender resilience, the GM approach actually places people. The beneficiaries are at the center of our interventions. They are at the center of every action that we are taking. And it also puts a lot of emphasis on the role of human rights and agencies. And that is how we are going to develop that capacity to cope for, cope for the uncertain crisis, you know, cope for the disturbances which we haven't seen so far. Also, when we look at disasters and crisis, it's already established that women actually tend to play a more leadership role. And we saw that, you know, Sherian talked about it, Jagjeet also talked about how women are at the center of this. So therefore, when we have, when we look at our GM model, the emphasis is on women in order to, you know, focus on their capacities. So if we can work on the capacities, the absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities of the women, that's going to have an impact on the household, and that's going to have an impact on the community. So what our GM model is actually doing is, it's, you know, when we look at gender resilience, we're bringing the transformability potential. We're also bringing uh, gender and feminine imaginaries and values into account. So the idea is that this model should, you know, it, it, it provides stability to households, particularly to women who are able to earn a regular income um, through their small businesses and also have savings. It helps our beneficiaries and their families uh, to uh, adapt to changing circumstances, which uh, can occur due to crisis. Uh, this is done through specific programs, which assist them in diversifying their livelihood options. Um, the graduation model also allows for transformation of livelihoods through social empowerment programs. Uh, some of these are focused on skills training, as well as also forming important community networks. This kind of resilience, especially during you know, the, the, the pandemic, we believe is actually a precursor to achieving structural changes in society that we all talk about. When we talk about changing community and family gender norms, when we talk about social change, and we talk about building community support networks, we believe that through GM, the gender resilience that we are building through GM will allow us to bring these structural changes. So given this criticality, of gender resilience and uh, you know when we say that this is what graduation model is, is is going to do we endeavored in this study to actually go ahead and evaluate right so we wanted to now for you know actually test that what we are saying that this is the outcome of our approach and this is what makes the gm so unique so are we actually fulfilling the promise that we are making through graduation model is this intervention actually working so we set out to evaluate and measure the resilience of uh, our beneficiaries who are part of the graduation model. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Over to you, Jagjeet. Thank you very much, Keithi. That's fantastic. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, our next speaker, who's actually going to tell us how we went about measuring both uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, so Dr. Sharif Rasal is a lecturer of international business at Flinders University in South Australia. Prior to joining Flinders, uh, Sharif had a position at Monash Business School um, and the Ministry of Public Administration in Bangladesh and the uh, Waganagan uh, Economic research in um, Netherlands. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharif's <laughs> interests, research interests are at the intersection of international business, strategy, and economic geography. Sharif is an alumni of uh, Monash University. He did his PhD at Monash University, and he is going to explain the method to us. Over to you, Sharif. Thank you, Jagjit, for your kind words. <clears throat> so I'll present uh, the methodology of this study in um, three steps. So in the first step, I'll discuss how we developed um, the instrument for data collection. Then in the second step, I'll briefly outline the data collection process. And finally, I'll briefly present uh, the data analysis technique. So can you please go to the next slide? Sure. Thank you. OK, so in developing a new instrument for this study, we actually addressed three important guidelines 
of the management literature. And the context of this study, the content validity of the instrument and the process recommended by the scholars in the field. And any new instrument development should take the constant of the study into consideration. So we generated the items for our instrument from an action aid toolkit. The action aid developed a toolkit to measure and compare women's and men's resilience to disaster risks in Bangladesh and in Pakistan. And they developed this toolkit using uh, the resilience framework in the South Asian context. So a toolkit measuring resilience to disaster risk in the South Asian context was a very good starting point to address the context and the content validity of this uh, instrument. So can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> okay, thank you. <laughs> so we adopted the toolkit to generate um, the Likert scale items or statements for the instrument. And uh, the items actually fall under four categories, the economic, infrastructure, social, and institutional. So the instrument includes um, statements on uh, respondents' access to economic resources, um, the reliability of the in infrastructure for them uh, to access basic services, their access to human and social resources, and finally, their participation in the uh, decision-making process at, at the border scale. So after we generated uh, the initial items, we extensively reviewed them in a number of sessions with the World Vision practitioners and the academics. Uh, the extensive review actually helped us to improve the quality of the instrument. And then we field tested the instrument in a focus group discussion in, in India with the beneficiaries. So again, we brought necessary changes based on the feedback we received there. So overall, we thoroughly followed a process, a rigorous process, uh, as many scholars recommended to develop a valid and reliable instrument. Once we were happy with the instrument, we moved into the next step in the data collection stage. So can you please go to the next slide? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, the previous slide. Okay, thank you. So uh, the data collection uh, was our second step. So in this study, you know, we wanted to evaluate, uh, like as uh, Kitty was uh, speaking, like uh, we wanted to evaluate the resilience of women beneficiaries who actually received support from World Vision under the graduation model program and who actually graduated from extreme poverty. So we did not know their initial resilience before uh, they started receiving the benefit from the World Vision under this program. So there was no option for us to see any difference made by the program or not. So we couldn't apply a difference in difference method to understand the impact of uh, this intervention. And to overcome this challenge, what we decided to actually, to compare their resilience with a group of non-beneficiary women, the women who did not receive any support from World Vision under the graduation model program. So to make it comparable, we identified an equal number of non-beneficiary women of similar contexts, like uh, uh, with similar demographic background and from the same location. So we had one, intervention group, and they are the women who received the benefits uh, from World Vision under the graduation model program. And there is another a group, and we call them the control group, and they did not receive any support under the graduation model program. And to actually, uh, to actually suit this requirement, like the requirement of our study, we actually adopted a passive te sampling technique uh, to collect data from these two group of women. And our hypothesis was that uh, the beneficiary women would have uh, a higher resilience compared to the resilience of non-beneficiary women. So uh, we surveyed them using um, a questionnaire uh, to collect uh, the quantitative information. And the questionnaire included uh, the instrument that we developed through the rigorous process. And it also in included some questions about the demographic information and some information of the four pillars of the graduation model so that we can actually compare them based on different factors of the graduation model. 
In addition to the quantitative analysis, we actually did uh, 14 focus group discussion uh, from in, in six different states. And this qualitative data uh, like supported us to validate our findings from the quantitative analysis. So Jagjit, can you please go to the next slide? Okay. So this is our sample. So um, uh, thanks to our World Vision colleague, and uh, we received uh, like a 1307 responses. So, and out of it, 655 are the responses from uh, the beneficiary group, like the intervention group, who received benefits under the graduation model. And we received uh, 652 responses from the control group, the women who did not receive any support under, uh, un under the, the graduation model program. And you see, like we, we got this data from six different states in India, Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Bihar, Karnataka, Mizoram, and West Bengal. Jagjit, can you please go to the next slide? Okay, thank you. So the final step was the data analysis step. Uh, so, and the, uh, you know that the data analysis actually should match with our theoretical argument. So from this discussion, you understand that theoretically we see um, an underlying model that resilience is understood by an individual's um, absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacity. So we see an underlying model. And based on this argument in this step, in the third step, I mean, in the data analysis step, we did a factor analysis to refine the construct and develop the scale. So in the first step, like we dropped items due to low factor loading and also due to cross loading so that we can ensure the construct validity of the scale. And once we dropped those items, um, the eigenvalue indicated a single factor. So uh, we did a factor analysis and the factor analysis led to a 25 item sorry, a resilience scale, so 25 item resilience scale. So there are 25 statements. And based on those statements, we actually got the resilience, like the empirical measure of resilience. So these 25 items explain 83% um, of the variation. And, uh, and you see the factor loadings are quite high. So and the alpha score is also quite high. So the factor loadings and the alpha score show the reliability and the validity of the scale. So Jagjit, can you, yes, thank you. So um, then in the next step, we, um, we actually calculated a factory score uh, for resilience. And this factory score was actually used for further analysis. So uh, first, we used this factory score for resilience to conduct an ANOVA test. So we did a one-way ANOVA test. So we started with a simple model. So we did a one-way ANOVA test to investigate uh, the resilience of the intervention group, I mean, the resilience of the beneficiary women with the resilience of the control group, I mean, the resilience of the non-beneficiary women. And the findings show that there is a significant difference between the, their resilience. And it also suggests that the intervention group got higher resilience compared to, uh, to the, the non-beneficiary group or the control group women. So it suggests that uh, the graduation model made a positive intervention in building resilience of women in India. And on top of this, we, we conducted 14 FGDs and those qualitative data actually helped us to further explain our quantitative findings. So I stop here and, and I hand over to Jagjit. Thank you, Jagjit. Thank you very much, Sharif, much appreciated. So um, the Q&A is open. Uh, if you have questions, please start um, populating your questions in the Q&A session, please, so that uh, uh, we have time to, to discuss um, the findings. Also, we welcome all your feedback uh, because we want to continue to fi fine tune this instrument. Okay, so let's move on to the findings. So the first finding was under the first pillar. Our findings were according to the four pillars. We debated this a lot. And uh, the first pillar is social protection. So under social protection, we have food security, health, education, and sanitation. So very clearly here, you see that um, 
the first area I uh, just wanted to say Sharif has is the one who has put all these slides together. So thank you so much. He did the quantitative uh, analysis. Uh, ability to produce food and mean resilience. So you see here that um, those who were able to produce food had higher resilience. So that was the first um, area that we looked at. Uh, for those who were not able to produce food to feed their families, the mean, mean resilience of the beneficiary group was higher. Moving on. Um, the descriptive data shows that even though land loan ownership is very low in both groups, we're talking about the ultra poor, so they don't have land. Uh, very few had any land at all, and even what they had was less than one hectare, and from what we understand, quite uncultivable until they uh, joined the GM program. Uh, we found out that many of them um, hire land, so that's important to know. So when the respondents were asked, have you been able to produce food to feed your family during the pandemic, a much higher number of beneficiaries reported yes compared to those from the control group. So you see here, 82.6% uh, said yes, and uh, compared to 45.5. Furthermore, 64% of the respondents from the beneficiaries group were able to sell their own produce for income. Talk about resilience, right? It's amazing. Why was this the case? Because they had received training, they'd been given seeds, they'd been given biofertilizers, they had been uh, given irrigation sets. So all these interventions proved to be vital when it came to a point of crisis. Now, uh, despite this, compared to the control group, a higher number of beneficiaries reported that their diet had become poorer uh, compared to the control group. Maybe the beneficiaries were eating better. Um, now close to a quarter of the beneficiaries noted that overall they were eating smaller portions of food. Further, a large majority of beneficiaries reported that their diet had become poor because their husbands had lost their jobs and so they'd lost income. So basically uh, an intervention point for World Vision uh, over here. Um, we continue here with the balanced diet and mean resilience. This clearly shows you that um, if you look at this, uh, those who had uh, a a diet with four categories of food had much higher resilience in the beneficiary group than in the control group. And we can explain these further. Moving on, health. So health was a very interesting one. Um, now, if you look at this diagram in terms of access to healthcare in the villages, there was no statistically significant difference between the beneficiary and control groups in terms of access to healthcare. That's probably because World Vision links the community is up to government health services and everyone has access to those in the World Vision area development programs. That's where World Vision operates. Similarly, there was little difference in access to reproductive health, birth attendance, antenatal care, postnatal care and other health care services during the pandemic. There was also little difference between the groups in terms of access to menstrual hygiene products. However, despite having similar levels of access to health care, the resilience of beneficiaries was still higher. Um, and uh, of course, we want to know why, and we will discuss that. If we look at vaccination, there was not much difference between the control group and the beneficiaries in terms of vaccination rates. However, our empirical analysis shows that compared to the control group, the beneficiaries who were vaccinated for COVID-19 had higher mean resilience compared to the control group, greatly building their adaptive capacity to face the shock of COVID. All right, moving on. So here we come to um, sanitation and this uh, clearly speaks for itself. So here is the control group in blue, um, sorry. Um, my mouse is moving around. So you can see that the resilience of the beneficiaries in both cases is higher. Uh, similarly, a functional sewage system and mean resilience. So again, you see that the beneficiary group that is in orange, even for those who did not have a functional sewage system right over here, uh, still their resilience was higher. And that we are finding out is mainly because this is a multi-pronged approach. Moving on, livelihoods promotion. And uh, our uh, results show that beneficiaries were able to considerably increase their absorptive resilience during the second wave of the pandemic because more than one family member was working 
before the pandemic, so overall income was high. During the pandemic, the men lost the job, but their savings were higher, and we'll come to that. Our data shows that 57.9% of the beneficiaries had two household members earning an income, which was more than double compared to the control group. Moving on. So you look, we looked at livelihoods promotion, and when we measured this, um, we looked at their ability to uh, be able to uh, bear the shock by selling productive assets. And you see here that the resilience of the beneficiaries uh, is much higher than that of the control group. Um, now, ownership of agricultural land and mean resilience, again, the beneficiaries, um, even those who do not own land, maybe lease land, but for those, the few who did own some land, you see their resilience was much higher. Uh, but on the whole, uh, even those who did not have land, their resilience was higher, and we will discuss again why that was the reason. Moving on, financial inclusion, a very, very important pillar of um, the graduation model. So the intervention here is that uh, women are helped uh, with uh, opening a bank account, they're given financial training, and they go through a self-help group to go and open a bank account. So you see here mean resilience on the ability to save much higher again for the beneficiaries. And even those who um, you see over here, there's a there's some difference here between those who are unable to save money. But when we look at the descriptive stats, actually there were many more uh, beneficiaries who were able to save as compared to those who were not beneficiaries or those in the control group. Mean resilience based on access to loan. Again, you, you found that the beneficiaries were actually, they were more resilient. They have a higher capacity to access loans. Uh, the only problem was that during the um, pandemic, it was difficult for them to get money specifically to write uh, the pandemic, the, the shock of the pandemic. Uh, and that we understand is because they can get one loan sometimes and not more than that. Um, and then the final pillar is the social empowerment pillar. And this pillar provides them with life skills, um, social integration and coaching, uh, network, um, uh, networking with other women, promoting community inclusion, positive behavioral change, and it's a very important pillar. And we found here that um, the empowerment in community and uh, mean resilience, sorry, I think these are both the same, <laughs> uh, are, um, it was higher for the, for the beneficiary group. Moving on, uh, we are now going to talk to um, Dr. Anjana. And I'm just going to introduce Dr. Anjana. Um, who is also from World Vision, and uh, actually she is um, the person who started this whole study. So Dr. Anjana Purkayasta is a Senior Director for Program Quality Strategy and Research at World Vision India. In this role in the last two years, she has been providing strategic and thought leadership to the organization. She oversees data and reporting impacts of all World Vision India's technical programs. In her earlier role, Anjana provided strategic leadership and management in fostering innovation, especially when it comes to cross-cutting intersectional issues such as gender and disability. She served World Vision International in the capacity of regional urban advisor for all South Asian countries. Um, she holds a PhD in plant biotechnology and an MBA from Eastern College, University of Philadelphia. Welcome, Anjana. Thank you, Jagjit. Thank you very much. So I'm going to present to you the implications of the findings. Findings have been already presented to you by Sharif as well as Jagjit in a very detailed way. So I'm going to share about how do we take it forward and what are the implications of this uh, graduation model that we are uh, implementing. But one general finding is the mean resilience of the beneficiaries is higher. And because of the multifaceted approach of the graduation model. So this study essentially confirms the efficacy of the graduation model, even during the crisis situation. Another very interesting uh, point is the control group and the beneficiaries of the graduation model were picked up from the same area. However, the beneficiaries of graduation model had an edge because of the knowledge sharing, the amount of life skill transfer that took place during this whole process of graduation model implementation. 
when it comes to building of resilience, we all know that resilience building is possible only through a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. Multi-sectoral because as Kirti has presented that a graduation model has looked at several uh, pillars. One of the pillar is social protection, livelihood promotion, financial inclusion, and social empowerment. And when it comes to uh, the uh, multi-stakeholder approach, we cannot attribute resilience building to just one entity or an organization. The role of government is very critical and also the role of the civil society. Next. Mm -hmm. Now come the social protection pillar. So this is a pillar as uh, Jagjit has already mentioned, it covers the food security, water and sanitation and health. So in terms of food security, a study clearly highlighted the fact that land is so important. Now, either it is a own land or a rented land. During crisis, it has really helped. And this can be linked to the training that was provided to the beneficiaries. And what we have seen that during the second wave of the pandemic, many of the beneficiaries were able to grow food. And that has really supported them. Access to sanitation and health facilities, even the control group as well as the beneficiaries had same access to sanitation and health facilities. However, because the, gen the beneficiaries had knowledge, they were able to make right use of it during the pandemic. So World Vision would propose to continue to build the capacity of the graduation model beneficiaries. Now, moving on to the next pillar, which is the livelihood promotion and financial inclusion. One very interesting theme, thing came up is that 25% of our beneficiaries sold their livelihood or productive set. It is very well documented that anybody selling their livelihood or productive asset essentially affects the resilience or in, in a sense, it reduces the resilience. So World Vision India would propose to discourage such immediate selling or distress selling of the productive assets. However, to also help them to think some alternative. That is what World Vision India is going to propose. Now coming to the livelihood as a pillar, it's a very fun intensive. However, what we have seen that in the long, long term, it helps the women to withstand the shock. So World Vision India is continuing their livelihood program. And uh, we would like to continue that so that the whole process of rebuilding or building back is strengthened from the pandemic, effect of pandemic. 75% of the beneficiaries were reported to not to have access to loan, loan scheme specifically during the pandemic. So World Vision India would be facilitating access to the emergency loan scheme announced by the government. Another uh, program that World Vision India would like to adopt is strengthening the businesses. Because what we have seen that during the pandemic, there are a lot, lot of local businesses that has emerged. So to strengthen that and also to facilitate linkages to the livelihood and skill training schemes of the state and central government. Next. So what are the implications that we have in the area of social empowerment? Very interestingly, the beneficiaries reported a high rate of gender-based violence in the village and the slum. It has to be looked at two different ways. One is why they are able to report high rate of gender-based gender violence in their own area. We know that when the awareness increases, the reporting of cases also increases. So the beneficiaries are much aware and hence the reporting has increased compared to the country. And to address the entire issue of gender inequality and gender-based violence, World Vision India has already integrated JESSE framework, which is a gender equality and social inclusion into all our development interventions. 
And the last point, what we have found, the study really helped us to understand that 30% of our GM beneficiaries needed assistance to deal with the poor mental health, which was caused by the pandemic. So World Vision India proposes to promote mental health and to provide psychosocial support by linking to the government and other mental health facilities. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Jati. Thank you very much, Anjana. That's fantastic. And thank you for picking up on all areas where World Vision is going to assess uh, the uh, graduation model uh, and make those changes. And as Cherian uh, will then lead that in the Asia Pacific region and hopefully it will go global. That's fantastic. Um, now we have the community voice and we have uh, with us uh, women who are beneficiaries of this model. And here they are. So if you could kindly turn your camera on, please. Basanti, West Bengal, yes, it's fantastic to see you. Um, we have Shampa Devnath, Banu Haldar, Anjana Mondol, and Palavi Mondol. Namaskar. <laughs> now they are going to uh, tell us. They're going to they're going to address all of us. And Sharif Rasal is requested to provide simultaneous translation, please. Uh, so if you could please ask them to uh, give us three sentences, and Sharif will. Uh, we'll translate. What I'll do is I'll switch, I'll stop share just for a second so we can see them. Okay, when you're ready in Basanti, West Bengal. We are ready. Thank you. Please start. Namaskar. Amar nam Shampadevna. Amar bari poshim bashanti. Amar bari te shwadosho holo pajjon. Amar Shami, Ami, Amar Duimi, and Amar Shashuri. Amar All Visioner, Torop Teke, UG Model Teke, Amar Tening Korai, Tening Korai, Tateke, Amar Ta, Salina Sin Pai, Dorsasto Dike, Salina Sin Tadi, Amar Shamshare, Kaje, One, Unoti Hoi. Okay, okay, eight minutes, eight minutes. Sharif? Okay, so um, she is actually uh, Shampa Devnath from West Bengal, and um, uh, there are five members in her family, and um, she got training under the graduation model uh, program from World Vision, and she also got a sewing machine, which actually helped them, like the, her family, to actually improve the financial situation. Thank you very much. Please continue. Salai machine ta kats kore, amar shangshare unnuti hoteche. Ba ami tatthe ke kichhu jomiye reke chilam. Ba jomi rakhar pore se jomano takata diye. Ami amar boro meke halo schoola bhotti korei. Halo schoola bhotti kore se kane hostel o rakhi. Ba tar pichone khorcha kori ba banke ami salai kore banke o jomai. Banke jomai abar post office o jomai pasho taka kore. Okay, Sharif. Yes, so uh, she like uh, she saved uh, some money from uh, that income, and she actually she was able to send her daughter to a better school, and she also was able to send her to like her daughter to a hostel. So, um, so, uh, and uh, she also saved some money in the bank account and the post office. So currently she is earning 200 rupees every day. That's fantastic. Uh, I just want to, through the Q&A, if you have questions for the Basanti group, please write them down so we can translate and ask them questions. You have a chance here to speak uh, to the actual beneficiaries, who by the way, are, um, they're very well networked. Uh, we are using grounded theory here. They are explaining the research to us. We are not explaining things to them. <laughs> okay, can, can you, uh, Sharif, you can tell her in Bengali to kindly continue. Yes. Yes, I'm not going to talk to you. No problem. Oops, I think we might have lost them. Oh, yeah, yeah there um, they are. Yes. They're back, yes. I think we lost them again. We are having a few connectivity issues. Yes, yes. Let's continue with Basanti. Um, 
and I probably will lost to them actually. All right, we've lost them, but it was fantastic to see mm -hmm. uh, the ADP and to see the World Vision Office. And uh, they've been waiting all morning uh, for this. I have to tell you uh, all our participants that. All right, um, what I'll do now is I'll just share my, my screen again, one second. And uh, we now welcome questions. So we're looking at the Q&A. We don't have any yet. Uh, so can you please uh, populate your questions? Oh, they say the chat is disabled. So uh, people are not able to ask questions. Uh, could you please use the Q&A to ask questions? The Q&A tab should be at the bottom of the screen. So we request everyone to please put their uh, questions, comments there. Thank you. Yeah, we, we lost the connection. We, we, are, we are back. Anything? Oh, you're back? Yes, thank you very much. Please, con please continue. We are back again. Yeah. Yes, ask her to continue, please, kindly. Thank you. Experience কোভিড এর সময় আমরা তার মানে বসে থাকতে পারিনি তার মানে সংসারের কাজ ছিল না স্বামী ছিল না সেরকমই আমরা মেশিন চালিয়ে সংসারের সাহায্য করতে পেরেছি ওকে লেট মি ট্রান্সলেট সো দে গট অ্যাকচুয়ালি মেনি ট্রেনিং আন্ডার দ্য দ্য গ্র্যাজুয়েশন প্রোগ্রাম फ्रॉम ওয়ার্ল্ড ভিশন সো देयर वाज अ ট্রেনিং অন হাইজিন ইস্যুজ देयर वाज अ ট্রেনিং অন দ্য স্যানিটেশন এন্ড দে দে অলসো গট ট্রেনিং টু অ্যাকচুয়ালি Uh, to actually create a garden at the backyard, like the vegetable garden. And during the COVID, uh, her husband actually lost a job, so didn't have any work to do. So she actually uh, actually fed the family, like um, uh, earning from her sewing machine job. Thank you. Can you continue? Our COVID is my Amaraje. তার মানে অনেকে গ্রামের মধ্যে ভ্যান পেয়েছে সেলাই মেশিন পেয়েছে তারা ভ্যানে করে সকালে সবজি বিক্রি করতে পেরেছে বিকেলে তাদের জুতো আছে তারা জুতো নিয়ে গ্রামে গ্রামে ঘুরতে পেরেছে যাদের সেলাই মেশিন আছে তারা সেলাই মেশিনের কাজও করেছে এই ইউপিজি মডেল থেকে তারা জিনিস পেয়ে তারা খুব খুশিতে তার মানে সংসারে সাহায্য করতে পারছে Uh, th thank you dhanyabad shampad devna so actually she was uh, speaking about uh, like uh, the the overall experience of many other uh, like the beneficiaries so from her village there are many people they got vans uh, and um, uh, many people actually many women actually got uh, like the sewing machine so the the people who were using the vans they helped them to sell the vegetables in different marketplaces or uh, different other vi uh, villages and um, and uh, like uh, they used to their sewing machine the sewing machine was actually life saver during the covid for many, many uh, beneficiaries not only her thank you so much uh, we'll take one final uh, comment uh, from um, uh, from basanti if anybody else wants to say anything continue please namaskar ami pallavi mondol ম্যাডাম আমি ওয়াইল মেশিনের পক্ষ থেকে কোভিডের সময় ইউপি যে গ্রুপের আন্ডারে যে সেলাই মেশিন পেয়েছিলাম আমি এবং তার সঙ্গে একটা ছাগলও পেয়েছি তো আমি এগুলো পেয়ে ভীষণ উপকার হয়েছি যেহেতু আমি মানে আমার একটা বাচ্চা আছে আমি সিঙ্গেল মাদার তো সেই কারণে আমার বাচ্চার খরচ চালানোর জন্য আমি ভীষণভাবে উপকৃত হয়েছি আর সরকারি যে সুবিধাগুলো সম্পর্কে আমি ইউপিজি মডেলের স্যারেদের বিভিন্ন মিটিং এর মাধ্যমে জানতে পেরেছি 
এবং সেই সুবিধাগুলো পাই আমি এখন এবং তার থেকে আমার অনেক মানে আগের থেকে আর্থিক একটু উন্নতি তো হয়েছে এবং আশা করছি আগামী দিনে আরো হবে Okay, so uh, she is uh, Pulimi Mondul and she is a single mother. So uh, she actually received training, but uh, she also received a shearing machine and a goat from World Vision. And they actually helped uh, to actually meet the expenses of her child. And uh, she also got uh, different information from World Vision regarding uh, the public, like the government supports during the COVID-19 pandemic. And all of this actually helped her to improve her financial situation and she's expecting uh, like uh, like her financial situation would actually further improve uh, um, uh, in future thank you so much mujhe bengali nahi aati lekin hindi aati hai aapka bahut bahut shukriya apne we wish you all the best and bahut bahut shukriya aapka and uh, i'm saying that it's the women who are going to launch this report and i click it on behalf of the women and uh, our report is now officially launched i'm just uh, ho hoping that it will open up there it is and we will make it available to all of you this is our report and um, it is a fantastic uh, job done by world vision india uh, these are all um, uh, people from world vision india who are part of their programs and here is our report so many many congratulations on the launch of this report can you please share the screen uh, of the report so one everyone... second we can't see that just one mm. second yeah thank you jackson namaskar amar naam anjana mondol ar amra khubi khushi je bharatborshe amader upg model theke eta amader report ar report ta prokashito hoyeche seta pe amra khubi khushi so she was actually uh, conveying uh, like thanks to every one of you she is very happy uh, having the report on on the, this model like uh, the model actually changed which actually changed their lives fantastic thank you so much so she has officially launched it guys and uh, we now move on to our q and a kitty can you please read out the questions thank you I'm actually going to ask Anjana. Yes. Uh, cuz she's uh, answering uh, some of the questions. Thank Thanks, you very Anjana. much. Yeah, friends, uh, the first question is uh, is it possible that those who graduate from extreme poverty go back to the ultra poor after the discontinuation of the program? my response is no because uh, for 24 months it's a long process capacity building their whole life skill is built their, i mean so many areas all the pillars are touched so overall the uh, beneficiaries as you have already seen in basanti how empowered they are so the next question over to sharif sharif out of the 25 items which is the distribution of item among the four pillars So, so do you have any distribution? Uh, actually, I didn't do actually any distribution. Uh, so um, if I know like the number and so the name of the, the so who actually asked this question, I can actually send him or her the answer later after the presentation. Thank you. Next question. Next question is, what was the method to identify the UPG families and control areas? That's Neil. Neil is here, so yes, over Neil. to Neil. How did you identify the ultra poor? You have to move a little bit. This yes. How did you identify the ultra poor, please? The control area. Yeah. Oh, the um, control group. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Control group. Yeah, actually, the one set we identify the beneficiary as very you know purposive sample. The other side, we just in the same village we identified equal number of. Uh, uh, women who have not received any benefits from World Vision. That's a criteria. Right. Now, the next question is, how does access to clean water and good sanitation affect ultra poor ability to improve their resilience? Mm -hmm. Access to clean water and good sanitation reduces the mobility. 
and improves the overall health and, and also reduces the chance of any infection. The next question, regarding the beneficiaries, how much time did it pass between the end of the UPG program and the data collection? Sharif or Neil? Yeah. Actually, this uh, beneficiaries are taken from the last our program, project, program cycle, that is uh, 2016 to, to 2020. So that is a five year just we have implemented the program. And uh, those set of beneficiaries, we have just taken uh, samples. Next question. Any household behavior changes observed during social empowerment? Yeah, household behavior changes. Yeah, behavior change, uh, especially the decision making level at the household, and also uh, men engagement. We have we have just men care model that is uh, mainly you know motivating men to engage and help and support in household activities. So there are changes in terms of men's participation in the household household level activity. And also behavior change related to personal hygiene behavior. So we we can list about around uh, no, uh, five to ten areas of behavior change we have observed. Uh, and just uh, Anjana, if I could just add on in terms of social empowerment, uh, it's difficult to put it in words. But when we were doing our FGDs. The amount of camaraderie that we saw in the groups of women beneficiaries was next level. How they were supporting each other, the confidence with which they were talking to us uh, about the graduation model and how it has helped them. Um, so like I said, it's difficult to put it in words, but we saw that and we felt that when we were doing our FGDs, talking to these uh, women uh, beneficiaries and seeing a, the level of friendships that they had developed during this program and uh, how they were they, they communicated to us that it will be okay. You know, in, in so many words, they came and told us that now they feel that they are ready for whatever, you know, the any kind of crisis uh, could come. And they just told us that they're going to be okay. And so I think that was a great way in which they showed us that there was social empowerment. Thank you. Right. Okay, next question. How beneficiaries and control group were able to cope up with the financial needs? Yeah, I think the findings also already, you know, shared by Sharif. Uh, the beneficiaries, since they have financial training, financial literacy training, they have access to savings, they have access to credit. That is more formal side. So it's a safer credit. Uh, so in terms of beneficiary, it's reported that they have access to credit. In terms of control group, they lack in accessing credit. So that was the you know, uh, two scenarios the data has revealed us. Uh, next question is, in terms of recruiting the beneficiaries participants, do you screen participants? For example, do you impose some criteria on how long have they been helped by World Vision? Yeah, this uh, beneficiary uh, inclusion criteria we have, and then also we have exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria we look at mainly in a uh, food insecure household, that is one, and also a uh, household having very limited livelihood assets. So the, there are some more criteria uh, we have based on that inclusion criteria we take, and our exclusion criteria like. You know, if uh, already salaried, if they have already food secured, uh, those kind of exclusion criteria, we just screen it. After this, we do a screening, household level screening. So that where the final, you know, this is confirmed. And in terms of uh, the beneficiary, uh, they are with this uh, graduation ultra poor program for 24 months. At 18 months, they are fully evaluated on the criteria, how far they are faring well. If somebody, some household, if falls out, we just, the next six months we support. So almost mm -hmm. they, they journey with us in this program for 24 months. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. 
Mm -hmm. Anjana, can we do the last question before we move on? Can I also say that with the questions, we you can always ask any of the team, email us. We'll be very happy to be in contact with you. So we mm -hmm. want to keep to time. So one last question, please. The last question is actually for me. Uh, Dr. Purkayasna mentioned the importance of discouraging the distress selling of livelihood and productive assets. I'm interested in knowing what may possible alternative could be promoted. So what we are doing currently based on the study, so all the UPG beneficiaries right now, wherever we are doing this UPG program, we have been able to uh, give them a training on how to adapt to income shocks. So there are two, three ways. One is to uh, adopt second income source, not to rely only one, only one income source. And second is to also keep on saving and access to credit. Thank you. Over to Jaji. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We have more questions and uh, we will um, seek to answer those um, later on. Uh, the other thing uh, via email, uh, we also will share the link with all those who have registered so that uh, you can find our report. All right, here we are. Um, and we now uh, I invite uh, Kirti uh, to go up to take us through the next steps for this for this uh, project, please. Right. Thanks, Jagji. So apart from uh, all the recommendations that uh, Anjana talked that World Vision is going to be incorporating in, in both the design as well as the delivery of graduation model, um, the next steps for us is that uh, we also want to look at regional analysis and, and the variation. Uh, we have uh, collected data uh, across six states in India, and uh, we know how diverse uh, India is. So we want to do a bit of a regional analysis to identify and explain differences across resilience in these six states. Um, this is actually only part one of the study. Uh, we want to take it further and uh, we want to do a longitudinal survey and uh, probably that will also shed some light on what happened. I mean, does resilience also uh, reduce uh, what is happening uh, to the beneficiaries of the graduation model? And uh, now with, with the COVID uh, receding a bit, uh, it also allows us, the researchers, the opportunity to engage in some ethnography and uh, talk and be with the beneficiaries. Because uh, I think uh, Sharif, Jagjeet and I, uh, we, we felt a little bit, uh, we, we felt we missed out on that um, because the circumstances didn't allow us to physically travel and meet and spend time with our beneficiaries. So that would be a next step for us that we would want to take forward. Uh, furthermore, we also plan to uh, work on some research uh, publications where we focus on uh, some critical implications uh, that this study has, uh, probably looking at uh, the idea of reorienting the idea of resilience and uh, emphasizing the multi-sectoral approach uh, to resilience. So those would be the next steps. And also um, maybe, you know, Sherian was talking about all the publications that World Vision does. And who knows, you know, the gender report could probably, the gender resilience report could also evolve into maybe an annual or a biannual um, uh, project that we all work on. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, uh, Kiki, if you could please uh, give a, a, a vote of thanks. And um, yes, that would be great. Thank you. So it's back to me. Uh, I have to say it's a real privilege uh, to be delivering the word of thanks today. As Jagjeet pointed out in the very beginning, uh, the seeds were probably sown over a tea conversation and then a sudden email for a grant and uh, but what brought this team together was the idea that we wanted to look at impact. And we're very grateful that we got to do this uh, study. Um, firstly, a huge thank you to the participants. You know, Thank you so much for joining the webinar. And uh, the link for the report will be shared with all of you. And we humbly request you to share your comments, to share your feedback, because we want to improve. Uh, this study was done with the idea of improvement. So please do let us uh, get back to us. You know, you'll have our emails as well. Uh, this gender resilience report is the result of collaborative efforts uh, between, you know, we had World Vision India, Monash, Indian Institute of Management, Udaipur, and Flinders University. And the study was led by Anjana. And we also had Madhav and Sherian who were, um, you know, guiding uh, Anjana uh, there. Um, 
We are extremely, I'm extremely thankful to all our panelists for taking time today and uh, sharing the journey of the report uh, with us. And a special thanks to Sony for joining us on such short notice. He just landed in Delhi and uh, we made him join the webinar. So thank you so much for doing this for us. Now, this study really would not have been possible without our beneficiaries. Um, they gave us their time. Uh, second wave of COVID was ongoing. Um, they opened their homes and hearts to us. So we are extremely grateful to, uh, to them. And today also, you know, we had Shampa Didi, Bhanu Didi, Anjana Didi, and Pallavi Didi who have joined us all the way from Basanti in, in West Bengal. So Dhanyabad Didi, thank you so much for joining us today and releasing the report for us. Uh, data collection was also supported from funding that we received uh, from the Australian uh, uh, government. It was part of the Australian Alumni Grants Scheme 2021, and we are very thankful to DFAT for their continued support. Uh, we also owe our gratitude to all the associate directors of Zones, senior managers, ADP managers, and the ADP team for anchoring our data collection in the field. And again, let me stress, this was when the second wave was ongoing and they have made this data collection possible, right? Uh, we are also very thankful to the different team members at World Vision India for their invaluable contributions in improving the rigor of this study. We've had numerous, numerous meetings, um, constantly working on the survey instrument, constantly asking each other questions that why are we doing this? What does this mean? And continuously contextualizing it as well, because we had these team members who are working in the field. So we are especially grateful to um, Jesse, who was the gender advisor, uh, Nirmal, uh, who is director of program quality and strategy at World Vision India, Francis Simon, data analyst. He also helped us a lot in customizing our instrument uh, for the data collection software. Uh, Subramanya Seva, Situ Banu, Emmanuel, and uh, Daniel for all your comments and uh, helping us develop this uh, instrument. Uh, we're also thankful to our colleagues from the media communication and creative services team for providing the editorial input uh, for the report. A special thanks to uh, Mr. Moses Pondraj and Paul Simon for designing the report. Uh, thanks also go out to the administration team at Amudepur who ensured that uh, the funding was transferred on ground to our enumerators. And lastly, I would also like to thank the Global Biz, uh, the Center for Global Business, uh, South Asia Research Network, and Critical Reorientations of Organization and Society at Monash Business School and World Vision India for organizing uh, this webinar. And uh, thank you, uh, Shahab. Uh, he's been in the background helping us all. Uh, he helped us a lot in setting up this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, and lastly, uh, to my team, uh, what a pleasure it has been uh, working with uh, all of you. Um, thank you so, so much. So once again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you panelists and thank you beneficiaries for joining us all the way from uh, Bengal. Uh, we will share the link of the report with you. Also, this webinar was recorded. Uh, the recording is also going to be made available to everyone. So thank you, everyone. We hope you have a good afternoon, good evening. Please send your comments, feedback to us. And take care and be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirti. We bring this webinar to an end. Before I go, I want to uh, thank Cherry and again. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for taking all these findings and learnings with you. Um, uh, we only have one dream, that this work has an impact on the ground and makes people's lives better. Anjana. What do I say? <laughs> uh, you are the person who held us all together. Um, thank you so much. And thank you uh, to the women uh, who make all this happen in the end. So um, have, a, have a lovely rest of the week, everyone. And you will hear from us again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.